Good morning. Welcome to Bible study here at uh, Bondurant Federated Church in our 845 hour. These are unusual times. I said, you know, um, used to be I get up early and go get a haircut. Now you got to get an appointment. It's like getting through to the president or something. So I'm a little shaggy, but uh, maybe I'll get my wife out of retirement to trim me up a little bit. Um, we're going to be uh, studying in Galatians this morning. I want to talk to you for a moment about Galatians. We talked about it being the gospel of pure grace. But I think sometimes we major on that gospel being grace just here and now and not yet in the future. And sometimes we have to recognize that past grace is a predictor of future grace and that it's going to be grace throughout all of eternity. That's the only reason we're going to be there. And so this morning, I want to start out by going back through the chronological uh, order of uh, salv logical sequence of salvation we talked about last week, just for a little bit, because we didn't really get into it very deeply. But if you turn to your Bibles, now, we're going to have, I don't put verses up on the screen, because I think it's good for you to get in the habit of opening your Bibles, so you can write in them and make notes. So we're going to start Romans chapter 5 this morning before we get to Galatians. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, number one, we have to understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You say, well, we all understand that. I'm not sure we do. I'm not sure in Bible-believing Christianity today that we spend this enough time really majoring on what the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ meant to us in our salvation. You see, these are the indispensable foundations for a faith in future grace. And their power resides precisely in that they, they purchase and they certify the future grace in which we hope. You know, hope in the Bible is different than hope now. I can hope for rain. That's been a disappointment a couple of times lately. But hope in the Bible is uh, assurance of something that's yet to come. And when we see the life and death of Jesus Christ, it's God's yes to all the promises that he makes to us in scripture. And we recognize that he's purchased us and he's gonna take us on to eternity. There, there are lots of things that God has done for us in the past, from birth to helping to pre prepare us to die. You know, I think today, um, how difficult it'd be to be in these times right now and have no hope for anything but today. I think that'd be very difficult. And uh, it's been a difficult time uh, for many people, but all this past grace isn't the same as the gospel events. Christ crucified and risen, that's unique. And because of this, all other grace has come to pass, come to us in the past and in the future. I like some of the old time writers. Some of you remember I used some of this in Romans last summer. Um, Harry Ironside is one of my favorite writers. If you ever get a chance to buy, sometimes one of his books will be on a cheap bookshelf somewhere or something. Harry Ironside is a great Bible teacher, very practical. And he wrote about this whole idea uh, by grace. He said, grace is not only unmerited favor, watch this, Grace is against merit. It's the goodness of God, not alone to men who have done and can do nothing to deserve it, but it's favor shown to men who deserve the very opposite. That's what grace is. It's favor to those who deserve the exact opposite. We don't know much about grace in our lives, do we? You know, sometimes uh, people do things and we say, well, you know, they're going to get what they deserve. Aren't you glad we don't get what we deserve? Spiritually, I am, you know. Uh, that was a great day for me when I, when I found that out. Secondly, he tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word justification we learned last, last week is, means to be declared righteous. And it's interesting because in the Greek construction of this word, this signifies to us 
It's a one-time legal decoration with continuing results. So in other words, when I trusted Christ, God said, Bob, you're no longer guilty both now and for eternity. And that's a tremendous, tremendous blessing. You know, faith, people say, I have faith. Do you really? You know, faith is based on things. You know, faith is a knowledge and assent to and also confidence in divine truths. And when I look at this, I, I start to ask myself, you know, when Paul said that, if, remember when Paul we were in jail and an earthquake came and the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? It just says a simple thing, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's a one-time event. When you trust him, it takes care of it for all of eternity. And that's, that's an important thing for, it's a one-time event, not continuous. So I had to ask myself the question, why does this faith produce obedience? Why would that faith produce obedience? Because God designed it that way. At the heart of future grace, it means being satisfied. This is important. It means being satisfied with all that God promises to be for us in Christ. Wow. You know, God is most glorified in us when we are satisfied in him. When I was studying this week, I had to ask myself the question, am I satisfied in him? And you say, what do you mean? Well, we're going through something called COVID-19 right now. And that kind of, you know, it's got everybody a little riled and concerned. And if you listen to the news, it'll get you more riled and concerned because the numbers and facts and everything change daily. But I'm satisfied in Christ that he which has begun a good work in me will finish it to the end. He's going to take us through this. He's going to take our country through this. I think we have to understand when Jesus, remember when they had the big storm in the boat and he woke up and said, peace, be still. He said, you know what he said to him? He said, just sit still and be quiet. You ever tell your kids that? Just sit down and be quiet. You know, that's what God's saying to his kids in this pandemic we're going through. Just sit still and be quiet. Listen to my voice. I will speak to you. And because of this, because we have understand that his death, burial, and resurrection was the foundation for all that we have in him, he now, when we put our faith and trust in him, he justifies us or declares us as never having sinned through his grace. And then look at verse 10. He reconciles us. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. Wow. Some people say, what does that mean? Saved by his life. Well, it means this. Sometimes I think we forget. Uh, we talk a lot about Christ's death, but we also have to remember it was not his death alone, but his resurrection that secured our salvation. We're saved through his life and through the fact that he ever liveth right now to make intercession for us. He didn't do a one and done. He is, throughout eternity, he's going to, his life is going to be for us. And I like the fact, this was something that really stood out to me when I got saved in verse 8 of chapter 5. He said, God shows his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I was raised in a religious system that taught a lot about good works. But you see, even as a young boy, I realized if this is all about good versus bad, I'm not doing so good. You know, I'm probably going to lose this battle. And so that had me, when I heard that I didn't have to change myself or do something different to be saved, that God was doing this work by himself without my help, it was all about him and not about me. And he loved me just the way I was. And then we've been justified by his blood and saved from the wrath through him. What a wonderful savior. That brought regeneration we learned last week in Titus 3, 5, which is a cleansing from sin. And that brought about sanctification, which is a set apart situation. Uh, both, you know, when we're first saved, 
God sets us apart as one of his children, just like our families are set apart from others to be part of our family. And we should be gradually, you see, this is where we fail in discipleship. Uh, Gil sent a thing out this week. It said, one out of three Christians aren't going to church right now. That's kind of, actually, want me to tell you the truth, I was surprised. I thought it'd be more than that because of this things going on. Fortunately, we have some online stuff like this. And I apologize because this isn't like it was with the Zoom groups. And we may try and do some kind of a Zoom thing in the future. Uh, so we have a reconnect, just a chance for groups to come back together, share what's going on in our lives and talk about prayer requests and things. And in August, we are gonna start the study of Revelation. Um, we don't, we're not sure what the format's gonna be. That depends on COVID, I guess. So we may be doing it like this. And if we do, then you'll be able to send emails if you want to comment or ask questions about it. Uh, it'd be nice if we could have some people present, but we don't know what that's going to be at this point. So we're just going to move ahead with it because we've kind of put it off long enough. And I've had this stuff ready since last summer, so I'm, I'm going to have to review it now. I won't know what to say, but I think it's important we understand that as believers... We need to continually be set apart for God's purposes in our life. Not everybody else's, but God's purposes in our life. And so we learned that the answer to guilt is justification. The answer to power is regeneration. Years ago, I was reading a book and Chuck Swindoll had written the book and he said I, he was on his way home from church and he came up, I don't know if you like to read bumper stickers, I do sometimes, depends on what they say, but he pulled up behind a car, had a bumper sticker on it that said, screw guilt. And he said, I thought, how unlike where I just come from is that idea? Now, I want to tell you this, there's real guilt and there's false guilt. Some of us walk around our whole life like this, carrying false guilt that we don't have to carry. There should be guilt for our sin, and Christ took care of that guilt. He died for my sins, was buried and rose again, and he justified me or declared me righteous. So I don't any longer have to be concerned about initial guilt. But can I tell you something? If you feel guilt over some of your actions in life, that could be real guilt. If you find yourself saying, I don't know if I should be doing this. Boy, this is probably not right. That's, that's probably real guilt. And you should confess it for what it is and he'll forgive it. All right, let's go to Galatians 3. I wanted to go back over that because I thought we kind of skipped it yesterday. When we talk about the gospel of pure grace, it's all about justification by faith and faith alone. Remember when Martin Luther uh, started that? It was kind of interesting. I was, uh, I was amused when I read, you know, we all hear about the 95 Thesis that Martin Luther posted on the church door. Actually, he didn't do that with the idea it was going to spread throughout the world. He just did it as a statement to the church, but somehow it got let loose and went all over. And so he said, we're justified by faith alone. And that's what we're still preaching today. Amen. We're still doing that today. Justification by faith. In the first two chapters, we saw Paul's personal testimony. You know, he may have one of the greatest testimonies in all of history. Here's a man that was dedicated to destroying the church and persecuting the church. And God met him and showed him the truth. And Paul was gloriously converted and it changed his life forever. He became as adamant about growing and promoting the church that he was about destroying. In fact, here's something for all of us to put in our thinking caps. Paul mentions, he said his single greatest sin was that he persecuted the church of the living God. We don't really need doing that. We all have opinions. That's okay. But we should not speak evil and try and persecute the church of the living God. It's God's bride. It's God's body. And so we need to respect it. Now, chapters 3 and 4 now shift from personal to doctrinal. Now, a lot of people today say, well, you know, doctrine divides. They're right. It does. Doctrine does divide. You know, but there's one thing that we can't 
compromise on, and that's the truth of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. And he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's no compromise to that. That's a doctrinal, you know, uh, statement of complete authority. And so as he does this, he begins, number one, with a personal argument. And uh, he begins, you know, Paul didn't always have fun times. Sometimes he had to rebuke people. You like to tell somebody when they're doing something wrong? That was one of the, frankly, that's probably one of the most difficult jobs in the pastorate is having to confront somebody about their life. But you know, uh, I always, I took a young man aside once years and years ago in our church. He'd been a pretty solid uh, kid. He'd brought friends to church and everything. All of a sudden, he kind of had this attitude. So I just took him in a room off the auditorium one Sunday night and said, you want to explain something to me? He said, what? I said, what's happened to you? What's with the attitude now? Why did you change so much? Well, he didn't have a good answer. He'd just gotten away from the Lord. That's what had happened. But you know, here's the thing. I always used to say to people when I go talk to them, I want you to understand something. I don't get paid extra for this. I don't get paid extra for talking to you about your life. In fact, I wouldn't have to talk to you about your life as long as I preach good sermons. Nobody cares. But see, I care because it's your best interest that you live a life that's glorifying to the Lord. And so here comes Paul to the Galatian church. And we're going to look at the first five verses of chapter 3. He said, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you are now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it, seemed, it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, Paul starts out by saying, you foolish Galatians. That's an interesting Greek word. It just means somebody that won't govern their feelings. Would you agree with me that most of society today lives by their feelings? Mm -hmm. We're in a very touchy-feely society today. It's interesting because desires uh, mostly comes from the Greek word epithemia, which is translated lust quite often in the scripture. We think of lust, we think of it as a sexual thing, but it's far more than that. It's anything that excites our senses. And if you watch it, advertising, politicians, everybody, do they try and appeal to your intellect or your emotion? Mostly it's emotion. And emotion drives people for a short time, but not always forever. What's wrong with emotion? Well, emotion changes according to circumstances. There's an old saying, remember? Let your conscience be your guide. Is that a good idea? No. Because conscience only functions according to the standard given to it. Now, most of us learned our conscience from our families of origin, you know, from our mothers and fathers, and they, they taught us certain things that were right and wrong. The scripture teaches us things that are right and wrong. And so we should let our conscience be our guide governed by the scripture. That's the thing. The standard we give to our conscience is the word of God. And he said, don't be foolish and unthinking. He said, what's happened to you? Well, you've been... Look at the next word, bewitched. That means I'm so fascinated that I've kind of lost my ability to think. You know, sometimes I get amused at somebody who something sweeps over them and they lose all capacity to be able to think through things. You know, they're so emotional, they can't think through things. And Paul said, look, you're not thinking and you've been fascinated by these people who've come to you. And who were they? The Judaizers, remember? Who came and said, it's not by grace alone, you also have to be circumcised. And they had a big council in Acts 15, and they said, not so. 
It's faith and faith alone, but the Gentiles should not deliberately do things to offend their Jewish brethren. That was their, their come for. Now he said this. This is interesting. He said, before whose eyes? Oh, that's interesting. What's that mean? They didn't see all this. Actually, it's a reference. Back in Bible times, there were certain places in the villages that they came and they posted official notices in public. And people read those notices and they were official. What Paul is saying here is, I've openly set forth Christ's permanent character as a crucified one. I have shown you before your eyes that Jesus Christ is a crucified one who died for your sins. And then he says in verse 5, wow, this gets interesting. He said, therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You know, sometimes we have to recognize. I always tell people, I remember old um, Adrian Rogers years ago, he said, if the church isn't supernatural, then it's superficial. You see, much of what we deal with and teach from the scripture is supernatural. You can't comprehend it with a, with a normal mind. The spirit of the living God has to come and equip us. And our primary equipment for service is God's miracle worker service producing spirit. Arriving in our lives according to his promise. Now, these for sure have been difficult times. In fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be speaking to you about what happened. Why is my mind going bad? <laughs> Something to that effect. Um, I woke up one morning early and was thinking through it, and it gave me an idea for a message. So I'm going to be speaking on that in a couple of weeks. But in Isaiah 41.10, here's what Isaiah said. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, our response is faith that God will keep his promises. Now, we struggle with that because all of us know people who made promises and what? Didn't keep them in this life. And so we have some question about whether that's going to happen. But we have faith. Listen carefully. We don't have faith in past grace where Christ died for us, was buried and rose again, and now justifies us. We have faith in future grace, which is going to go on for all of eternity. And that's powerful. Let me just say, as we're thinking about this whole idea of our primary equipment for service, I sometimes wonder, as we all do, why aren't more people concerned about serving? Why aren't they more into the Christian life why isn't the local church and the work of God more important to them? Well, I think we have to understand, while the spirit of living God indwells us as believers, we can grieve him or we can quench the spirit. And that happens in our lives, all of us sometimes. We're not receptive to what God wants us to do with our lives and serve him. You know, we all quote the Great Commission of Matthew 28 when Jesus said, all power or authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I read a book a while back. I like to read books. They're just authors, but sometimes they, they say something I'm interested in. There was a ch church that was trying to plan an outreach. They wanted to do something to outreach to their community. So they began to pray about it. And different people came up with different ideas and different pieces. And they sat down, they put it all together, and they ended up putting together a large event in the local park, and it was very successful. They'd prayed a lot about it. Next year, they put on the same event. You know, if it works once, it's sure to work twice, right? It didn't work so good. And when they were reviewing why it didn't, somebody said, I want to make a point here. Last year, we prayed a lot about it. This year we just did the event. And I think that's a good thing to think about. Um, I think we forget to pray for God's direction. And for you folks that are joining us today, we've got a lot of prayer warriors out there right now. We need to be praying 
about how God wants to use Federated Church to reach the surrounding area for Christ. Everybody will have some different ideas. Pray about it. Pray that God will lay it upon all our hearts of a good way that we can start reaching out to people even during COVID-19 and show people that Christ is the answer to our problems. And I, I think if we do that, uh, we might see some interesting things happen. I think sometimes we forget that the power in ministry and the power in reaching a community isn't found in our genius ideas and programs as much as it is in trusting the one who has all authority to lead us and direct us and use the word of God. You know, it may be that we don't have a big event. Maybe it's more God's laying upon our hearts of how we reach an unsaved world one by one. One of our ladies in the church during this time was talking on the phone with a longtime friend, classmate who'd started going to a little church. And she started questioning about his faith. And he came from a difficult background in his younger years here in the area. And lo and behold, right there on the telephone, she prayed with him to receive Christ. COVID-19 didn't stop her from being evangelistic. And that man now is on the way to heaven, back up in his little church again, and excited about knowing Christ as Savior. You know, when people engage us sometimes, we don't see as much of people as we once did. That's a problem because everybody's kind of, you know, we're socially distancing, and that's good. We should do that and wear a mask as appropriate. But we don't have that interconnection. But when we get an interconnection, we need to ask God to give us a way to lead them into a spiritual conversion. Everybody's probably talking about COVID-19. I'm scared, I'm this, I'm that, you know. Well, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm scared, I'm cautious. I'm not gonna run out and say, here, breathe on me. But, uh, but, I, <clears throat> but I also realize that God is greater than the COVID-19 and he's gonna use this for his honor and glory. It's given us opportunities to serve other people by uh, going and picking things up for them or do things for them. It gives us a chance to expand our borders. Uh, so that's what it's all about with the personal argument. Let's talk about the scriptural argument, verse 6 of Galatians 3. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now this is a, a message all its own. Sometime we'll take time and talk about what it means to be a child of Abraham. Because that's a whole message in itself, but we're just going to skirt it today a minute. And it says in verse 7, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham before, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are faith, of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now let me bring you back to something. Abraham didn't believe the gospel we believed. Remember what gospel means? Good news. The good news. And the good news that God brought to Abraham in Genesis 12, you're going to be the father of many nations. And you're going to be a father of, well, actually a father of the whole world. Uh, did Abraham walk perfectly after that? Shake your heads like this. No, he sure didn't. He made some gigantic mistakes. But what he's saying here is Abraham is saved by faith. Now, another old writer I like is William Newell. You ever get a chance to get one of his books, it's good. As you can see by the condition of this one, I got this pretty cheap. But anyway, it, it still reads. So William Newell wrote this. <clears throat> he said, when Abraham believed God, he did the one thing that a man can do without doing anything. God made the statement, the promise. God undertook to fulfill it. Abraham believed in his heart. <clears throat> that God told the truth. There was no effort here. Abraham, now listen carefully. Abraham's faith was not an act. It was an attitude. It wasn't an act. It was an attitude. And because of that, his heart was turned completely away from himself to God and his promise. This left God free to fulfill the promise. Faith was neither a meritorious act by Abraham nor a change of character or nature in Abraham. He simply believed God would accomplish what he had promised. 
In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed in Genesis 12. By the way, that's still, that's still good for today. God told Abraham, I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. So it's still good today. That's why America should always be on the side of Israel. That's a biblical proposition. It's not just a political statement. Now, what about the children of Abraham? Well, we do know this. The Bible says they've not all believed our report in Romans chapter 10 and uh, verse 16. He said, they've not all believed the gospel for Isaiah said, Lord, who's believed our report? And then Paul said, notice, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I want to let you know something this morning. Nobody ever gets saved apart from the word of God. It's the word of God directed by the spirit of God that shows us our sin and reveals a savior to us who died for our sins. Those who depend on the law are in a big problem, Galatians 3, because it says this, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now you see, those who depend on the law, they can't share in the blessings because they're under the curse. And we need to remember this, there's no justification in ourselves, it's only through him. So as long as you remain under the curse, trying to do the law, we're in problems. Now our time's fleeting away, but I want to take some time uh, to get through the logical argument. Beginning with verse 15. Brethren, I speak in a manner of men, though it's only a man's covenant, yet if, if it be confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham, his seed were the promises made. He doesn't say to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. This I say, that the law, which, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God by Christ, in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance of the law, uh, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator, now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly, true righteousness and would have been by the law. But the scriptures confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, notice this, we were shut up or kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith would after, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor, our schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ. You might be justified by faith, but after faith has come, we're no longer under our schoolmaster or tutor. It's interesting to see in this argument. Number one, the law was temporary. It was for Jews only, and it didn't actually come for quite a while after they left Egypt, 430 years it says. Then secondly, the law convicted of sin, but it never saved. Look at verse 21 again. Is the law against the promises of God? Certainly not. If there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scriptures confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. There's that word again, who believe. And so Paul's just simply telling us here, the law is not against God's promises. It reveals sin and forces us to trust God's promises. The law simply concludes this, all have sinned. Secondly, all can be saved by grace. There's never been anyone, I remember years ago when I was managing a group of, of uh, younger people, college graduates, one of them came and said, oh, I really messed this up, a project they were doing, I really goofed up, I'm really sorry. I said, well, you remember one thing, there's only one person who was sinless in this life, who never made a mistake and they crucified him. 
So we start to recognize the law concludes for all have sinned and come short of the God. There's none righteous. No, not one. <clears throat> and so the law prepared the way for Christ. The Bible tells us here before the faith came, which we now know, they were shut up, revealing their need of a savior. The law became this schoolmaster or tutor. Now, what that means is as a child conductor years ago, households had a child conductor, took care of the kids, made sure they got to school on time, made sure certain things were done. They let them around seeing that they did the appropriate things. The law was just that for us. It was a revelation. It was there until the revelation of Christ came uh, and the gospel was given to Jews and Gentiles alike. You know, gospel means good news. So when you read the scripture sometimes, you're going to see the word gospel where it doesn't seem to mean the same thing you think of it as meaning, but it just means good news. And so that's what it was. Galatians 4 talks about the believer's sonship. And we're going to move through this quickly as we close. I just want to show you some things. Paul said, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, doesn't differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. But he's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the full, this is a beautiful verse. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. When you look at that, that picture, the fullness of time came when there were religious, cultural, and political conditions that were demanded by his perfect plan and they were all in place. The Pax Romana, the road system all through the world, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son at the appropriate time. And then in verse 5, it says this, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, know is, uh, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements? He said, at one time, you served all these things in life that you thought were gods, but they were impotent. They weren't able to do anything for you spiritually. And he said, you finally came to realize that. So after you trusted Christ, how do you now turn back to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire to be in bondage? He said, you're back observing days and months and seasons, years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. One of the serious questions I have in my Christian life, and you do too, all of us have probably known somebody who really locked into the faith early on. I knew a guy years ago, and I mean, he got saved, and that guy witnessed to everybody, talked to everybody he, that he got a chance to about the Lord. And one day, he was delivering a bunch of material to us at our church, and it, by this time, He'd faded away. You're no longer really very active or doing anything. I said, can I ask you a question? Whatever happened to you? Why did you kind of drop out of the faith? He said, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Now, we all know some people get disappointed in somebody in the church or the pastor or somebody. But you see, my faith isn't in a pastor or church people. My faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because everybody here is going to disappoint sometimes. You know, uh, if you don't believe that, ask my wife about me. We're going, to, we're going to disappoint. That's just the way it works sometimes. But we have to understand, we've trusted Christ for eternity and for future grace. Why do we turn back to the things that are only good for here and now? You know, what would it be like to be without hope and without God in this world right now? It'd be a difficult thing for me. It'd be a difficult thing for everybody. Now, Paul then moves to an argument about the two uh, sons of Abraham. 
You remember, I'll just review quickly without looking at a lot of scripture. Abraham had received a promise from God that he, he was going to be the father of a great nation. Well, it wasn't moving quite as fast as he wanted it to. That ever happened in your life? You want God to move a little quicker than he's doing? Well, it wasn't moving as fast. And so Abraham was married to, had a wife. And instead, he took his handmaid, Hagar, because his wife was not able to bear children at that point. So he took Hagar. He took life into his own hands. This is a great, great mess, lesson for us. Don't take life into your own hands. Trust God for it. And so he went into Hagar. She conceived and had a son whose name was Ishmael. Then later on, you remember, God told he and his wife, you're going to have a child. Remember what she did? Laughed. Laughed at the, you know, she was not believing. And uh, what happened? She did have a child. His name was Isaac. And it's interesting because when you think about this, Look down in the, in the scriptures here, verse 24, which things are symbolic for these are the covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, that's Hagar. And for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. You remember what happened? After Sarah had her baby, she didn't want Hagar or any other baby around anymore. So she banned her and kicked her out of, the, out of the camp. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of all. Now look at verse 29. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him, was born according to the spirit, even so it now is. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we're not children of the bondage, but of the free. You see, as Christians, we are children of the promise, like Isaac, and therefore children of liberty. One of the times we were together last, I remember our choir saying, that's what it means to be free. That resonates through my head every so often. I think about that. That's what it means to be, you know. And I think it's good that we remember what it means to be free. It means that we're children of Abraham and that we receive the promise. And because of that, today in this world we live in, because of his mistake in not following God, he created Ishmael and Isaac, the Arabs and the Jews. And to this day, the Middle East is completely unsettled because of that error of Abraham way back then. It also teaches this. This is a dispensational argument. Listen, God's word is shown to us how it relates to three things. In 1 Corinthians it says, the Jew, the Gentile, the church of God. Everybody's in one of those camps. You're either a Jewish person by lineage, you're a Gentile person, not Jew, or you're part of the church of the living God You've trusted Christ, been baptized into the body. I want to ask you this morning as we close, what group are you in? Are you in the church of, which is his body? Have you trusted Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection? And mark that as your claim for all of eternity because he did it for you. And there's been a time in your life when you did what the Philippian jailer did. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ once for all. Trust in him as your savior from your sin. And this morning, if you haven't done that, it's very simple. You bow your head right there at home and ask God to forgive you your sins and say, Lord, I see now that Christ died, was buried, and rose again for my sins. And this morning, I want to ask him to come in my life, forgive me of my sin, and be my savior. And today, you can become a child of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God and for the promises you give to us. We ask for those who are at home today, Lord, that you'll bless them and keep them, encourage their lives and their hearts. And we ask for the after service now as Pastor Trevor comes and ministers to us. I use the word of God in our lives, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. We'll see you next week.